Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, sometimes the future. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 73, and soon Volume 2, 1974 to 1980. And I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. And he also has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which you should check out because it's packed with Beatles-related interviews and other things. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. How's it going? It's going pretty well. Looking forward to today's show. Yeah, it should be fun. And my other co-host, Darren DeVivo, um, who's been a DJ at WFUV 90.7 in the New York area since February 1984. There you go. If you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else on WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello, Alan. Hey, Ken. Uh, happy holidays, everyone, and welcome to our last show of 2023. Mm. And this is going to be a, a slightly different show than what we usually do. We have three guests. First, our our old pal, Walter Everett, who a lot of you know as the author of The Beatles as Musicians, incredible two-volume series. If you don't know it, you should get it. And if you get it and you don't understand all the music theory in it, you should learn the music theory because two great books um, goes into this stuff in a way that nobody else does. Walter is uh, also a professor emeritus of music theory at the University of Michigan. Also, Jack Petroselli, uh, who is you pr most you probably know him as a founder of the Fab Faux, which is one of the best Beatles yes. tribute bands. Um, he's also a multi-instrumentalist and producer. He's worked with Joan Osborne, Ian Hunter, Patti Smith, lots of other people. Um, he's going to be talking to us as well. And the third person is Cameron Greider, uh, who's also a multi-instrumentalist and producer and has worked with Natalie Merchant and Joan Baez, Chris Cornell, uh, Sean Lennon and lots of other people. Um, the three of them have this thing that they call the RPM school, where they discuss albums and how they're made, um, in particularly Beatles albums. Um, they're currently finishing a course on Sgt. Pepper. These are online courses, so everyone can tune in if you want, and they'll tell you all about how to do that. Um, in January, they're going to be starting a course on the White Album, and that's what we're going to be talking about with them, and they're going to give us a sort of a sample of what some of their classes are like, and you know, plus we'll be having a back and forth with them. So I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, But in the meantime, we have some news. Not all okay. of it happy news from Ken. Certainly not. Um, but I am looking forward to talking to those three great guests that mm -hmm. we're going to be uh, mm -hmm. talking with in just a few moments from now. Uh, the biggest news story, obviously, of the past two weeks is the very sad news on the passing of Danny Lane. To Beatle fans and McCartney fans, he'll best be known for his tenure in Wings, as he was the only member, other than Paul and Linda, who was there from the formation of the band to the end. And even after that, Denny played on the Tug of War and Pipes of Peace sessions. But before that, he was in a couple of bands that played at the same concerts as the Beatles. First with a band called Denny Lane and the Diplomats, they shared the bill on a show in July 5th of 1963. And with the Moody Blues, they both played at the annual Pop Prom at Royal Albert Hall, September 15th of 63, with many of the top bands of the moment, the Rolling Stones, Herman's Hermits, Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders and others. And speaking of a star-studded cast, the Moody Blues and the Beatles were part of the NME annual poll winners, 
for 1964 and 65 at the Empire Pool in Wembley, along with the Rolling Stones, the Animals, and the Kinks. And the Moody Blues were part of the Beatles' UK tour in December, actually December 3rd through the 12th of 1965, with most of those dates performing two shows each day. Denny died on December the 5th from interstitial lung disease. Ironically, that date, December 5th, is the actual 50th anniversary of the release of the Band on the Run album, but that was in the U.S. It was November 30th in the U.K. And uh, Alan and Dan and I will be sharing our feelings about um, his major contributions and wings in just a moment, but I thought I would read a few quotes from very important people for whom Denny touched their lives. Of course, the quote from Paul McCartney, his statement, uh, he said, I am very saddened to hear that my ex-band, and I am very saddened to hear that my ex-bandmate, Denny Lane, has died. I have many fond memories of my time with Denny from the early days when the Beatles toured with the Moody Blues. Our two bands had a lot of respect for each other and a lot of fun together. Denny joined Wings at the outset. He was an outstanding vocalist and guitar player. His most famous performance is probably Go Now, an old Bessie Banks song, which he would sing brilliantly. He and I wrote some songs together, the most successful being Mullet Kintyre, which was a big hit in the 70s. We had drifted apart, but in recent years managed to reestablish our friendship and share memories of our times together. Danny was a great talent with a fine sense of humor and was always ready to help other people. He will be missed by all his fans and remembered with great fondness by his friends. I send my condolences and best wishes to his wife, Elizabeth, and family. Peace and love, Denny. It was a pleasure to know you. We are all going to miss you. Love, Paul. Some other musicians commented on the death of Denny Lane. Uh, why don't I read a couple members of Wings here? Lawrence Juber said, Denny was Paul's right-hand man. When I was a session musician in London, Denny recruited me to replace Jimmy McCulloch as Wings lead guitarist in 1978. He was a compelling songwriter and performer, a rock authentic, having a deep soulfulness infused with a folk sensibility. Denny Sywell said, heartbroken with sadness at the passing of my pal and bandmate, Denny Lane. My heart goes to his wife, Elizabeth, and his children. He was a one of a kind for sure. God blessed him with a spirit for music and making people happy. My wife, Monique, and I will miss him terribly. From the time we spent together at our farm in Scotland to our Wings tour bus to the stage, he has taken a big part of our hearts with him. Rest in peace, my dear friend. A few other people commented here. Mickey Dolans of the Monkees said, A friend, a wonderful person, and a great musician. You and your music will be sorely missed. Axel Rose said, very sorry to hear of the passing of Denny Lane. Wings has always, on the daily, been a big part of my life. Stephen Bishop, incredible talent. Denny's musical style and songwriting influenced so many. His contributions to the Moody Blues and Paul McCartney's band Wings will forever be iconic. Nancy Wilson of Heart, a sad day to lose the great Denny Lane. We recently played Carnegie Hall for the music of Paul McCartney benefit. My admiration for Denny goes back to his work in the Moody Blues and, of course, Paul McCartney's Wings, and he co-wrote one of my all-time favorite global hit songs, Mull of Kintyre. I'll forever cherish the thrill of singing and playing with him on my birthday, the best gift of all. And finally, there's Bev Bevan. Mm. Bev was in Denny and the Diplomats, and, of course, he went on to join ELO as their drummer. Um, he said, I am so sorry to hear that my old friend Denny Lane has passed away. He was such a talented singer, guitarist, and songwriter. He had been in hospital for a long time when we were in touch with his wife, Elizabeth. We thought he would pull through, but sadly not to be. Denny and I met in 1963 when he asked me to form a group together, which went on to be called Denny Lane and the, and the Diplomats. Later that year, we opened for the Beatles at the Old Hill Plaza. He was the most positive person I'd ever met. He was totally sure that he would make it big in the music business and told me that I would too. The world of music has lost a great talent. Rest in peace, Denny, Bev. And with that, I thought we'd all just share our feelings about Denny Lane and 
his many years in wings, or if you want to comment about the Moody Blues and what your thoughts are on his tragic passing. Uh, why don't we start with Darren? I was getting a little choked up listening, listening to you read all of those. Um, you know, I've said this on uh, this show a number of times over the years that, you know, um, 58 and grew up, came of age, grew up in the 70s and wings were it. They were my life. Beatles were actually second. And this was because, of course, wings were current in the 70s at the time. And as I got older and learned more and became more familiar with the music and the history by the middle 70s of course john stopped and was sort of out off the radar uh ringo disappeared from the radio and the charts george was around and wings were everywhere so it was a natural that uh for me uh that as 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 i now say to refer to myself as as a beetle fanatic that in the 70s growing up um <clears throat> wings the, the the world the sun rose uh rose and set is that proper english uh the the, the sun came up and went down uh on wings music and i pretty much have very very vivid memories of where i was when i heard certain songs where I was when I got certain albums, actually physically had them bought for me or bought them myself, listened to them for the first time. Um, and Denny was the guy. Paul and Linda, of course, that's, you know, they were they were there, obviously. But Denny was there. He was like he was like the, the dependable pal that was a little bit in the shadow but was always there mm -hmm. um and i mean it, it, it some of my favorite wing songs are either tunes that he wrote or sang no words time to hide right uh deliver your children uh mull of kintyre of course um i lie around i remember getting my hands on a copy of when I bought Live and Let Die, when I was, I had become old enough to kind of take some of my allowance. I decided I was going to try to track down these songs that were on the B sides of singles that weren't on any album, you know. And I remember getting the high, high, high excuse me, high, high, high single, and um, and I loved I lie around, and I was like I was wasn't positive at the time, but I was pretty sure that's not Paul singing got to be Denny and it was his first lead vocal as it turns out so I'll admit that I found it very difficult to follow Denny's career after Wings because it seemed as so Japanese sort of came out wasn't that easy to find necessarily in stores never heard it on the radio disappeared you know just kind of and I mean, his records would cut an album would come out. You wouldn't see it again or CDs. It was, it seemed like compilations were coming out on these little hole in the wall labels. And, um, and I kind of lost, lost touch with a guy that was like, kind of like a, a favorite of mine, but kind of not a household name. Um, if you, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, but you know, having met him, briefly interviewed him at WFUV because he had come up there was an event um, there was an event uh, that he was involved with with Peter Asher and I don't know if it was a one-off concert or something in New York City and he uh, came it was really a Peter Asher event Peter and his band that he was playing with included Denny Lane came up to WFUV and Dennis Elsis it did the actual interview but it worked out perfectly that I was live on the air at the moment um, doing middays. Dennis was recording the interview in the next studio and they wrapped up and I probably still had about a half an hour left of my show. And I think Dennis put Denny on the air. Have Dennis, did, you know, I was always like, you know, oh, I'm going to get in trouble with management. 
you know, and because uh, we didn't plan on. Uh, and Dennis says, no, put Danny on the put him on the air. And I ended up interviewing him for about a half an hour. And I was like, actually, it was a great time because I didn't have time to get too nervous or and over prepare for it. It was a very down low key uh, conversation. And then that night, this is a funny story. I don't mean to go. Everybody ended up traveling north and spent the night in Westchester County. OK, uh, which I didn't know at the time. That night, I'm home, relaxing, I'm on my computer, and on Facebook, I see a post coming from, it might have been a Denny Lane post or something like that, and it said where he was. You know, the Facebook, sometimes you get it, if you don't have your privacy set, mm. you tell people where you are at any given time. He was staying at, a, they were all staying at a very seedy motel in the next town over from where I lived. I'm talking about this was a motel where it really needed to be closed because it it was not the Hilton. This was an old dump. And I messaged Denny. So Darren DeVivo here, you were on my show today on WFUV. May I ask you a question? I live in the next town over. What on earth are you guys doing at, you know, at this particular hotel? And I don't recall if he answered me or if he did, it was very quick up. We just, just was on the way and we stayed. I was like, oh, and that was that was the last contact I had. Uh, I think, you know, he was a hero for me. I tend to I tend to always gravitate to the to the quiet one in the shadows. Uh, huge, I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan. My favorite member of Pink Floyd is Richard Wright. Uh, my favorite Mets baseball players were Ed Cranepool, Ron Hodges, uh, who recently passed away. Guys who weren't the star, but they were like, they, they were, you depended on them. They were always there. You could always count on them. So, so um, rest in peace, Denny. Thank you for all the music. Glad I had a few minutes to actually tell you how much you meant to me and how much the music meant to me. And, uh, Alan? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add to yeah. that. Because you were talking about Denny and Peter Asher on the same bill. What was the club that um, Les Paul used to play at all the time? Oh, oh, Iridium? Iridium. Yes. I think that's where it was because I went to that. Yeah. That's right. And it was, but it was more of a Peter Asher event, I think. I think. At least he was the guy who was sort of, he was booked by WFUV. I guess Peter Asher's manager that was all and peter the show was coming up for a, a record to record a session right and that might have been also the angle we had you know let's get denny on the air to plug the show because the show is tonight or whatever we had recorded the interview for future broadcast but mm -hmm. hmm. all right um, anyway rest in peace denny and thanks for all the music okay alan yeah, um, you know, what I sort of hope is that his um, wife is able to go through some of his tapes and release some of the stuff that, um, you know, sort of gives an overview of his career that isn't out there now, because he did an awful lot of stuff um, after the Moody Blues. And, and by the way, the Moody Blues were briefly managed by Brian Epstein. So there was another Beatles connection there. Mm -hmm. um, after the Moody Blues, he started this um, sort of string band. I, I can't remember the name of it. Um, Electric String Band. Yeah. And in fact, oh, they, oh. Had a, they had, you know, a combination of classical players and, you know, Denny and other rock players and, 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 you know, what he, he had said was that he was really interested in this concept, but the classical players were always sort of having to bow out of gigs and rehearsals because they had, you know, freelance classical gigs. And so it just didn't sort of work. But if they made any, um, you know, if they have recordings that weren't released, I think um, it would be sort of fascinating to hear some of those. Um, <clears throat> and then he was in a group called Balls. Um, which was uh, based, I think, in, in Birmingham, where he was from. And uh, the drummer was Alan White. So, um, 
you know, Alan White went on to lots of other interesting things. And uh, but actually a lot of a lot of other people came and went from that group, too. It had a, a sort of inconsistent uh, membership because it, you know, they were working on an album that never, uh, never finally got finished. But there may be some some balls recordings that uh, that perhaps mm. he has in his archive that um, perhaps his wife could uh, get together and bring out. I, I think, you know, I think um, all of this kind of thing would show a, uh, a side of Denny that most people haven't heard. Um, <clears throat> in between the electric string band and balls, he went to uh, live in Spain for a while and learned uh, and studied flamenco. Um, so, you know, that's a, another interesting side. I don't know if he made any home recordings of that kind of thing that would also be interesting to hear. Um, but, you know, in, you know, we know him mostly from Wings and uh, and he was a really important part of that. I mean, when the band pretty much almost fell apart on the eve of recording Band on the Run, Denny was there. Denny went to Africa um, help Paul with the sessions. Uh, Paul, Linda, and Denny did the whole thing by themselves. I mean, apart from when they came back and did orchestrations and things. Uh, and um, you know, Denny sort of really sort of helped hold that down. And it was it was really kind of strange and unusual that you know when he came back and and would sort of reflect on it, he would say, "Well, you know, that was a." That was really a Paul and Lynn album. I was just a utility man. I mean, he was more than a utility man. <laughs> I don't know why he, uh, you know, sometimes it was sort of hard to figure out, you know, why he would say things that he would say. I mean, uh, when Paul was encouraging him to write more stuff for Wings, um, he was saying, well, you know, I just don't have any material. And he would say that in interviews to promote Alain, his solo album, which <laughs> which had just come out, so you know he obviously did have material. Maybe he maybe he considered stuff he did for Alain not stuff he was going to do for Wings, you know, and that if it was going to be for Wings, it had to be totally new. Um, but you know, right before he joined Wings, what he was doing was. Uh, he had sort of a songwriting contract. Like if, if it was New York, you would say Tim Pan Alley. Um, I guess in Britain, you might say Denmark Street. But uh, he, he had a contract to write songs for other people to record. And um, you know, he was working on that when Paul called him and said, what are you doing? You want to come up and form a band? Um, so, you know, uh, there are a bunch of those songs. And again, there, you know, there must be some of those songs that didn't get used by anybody that, you know, maybe someone could pick up and, and do uh, finally get those those songs heard, too. So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, he was he was a fascinating character, sometimes a little frustrating, sometimes mm. frustrating to figure out, you know, what it was that he had in mind when he would say things like, I'm just a utility player and, you know. But um, yeah, it's it's you know I'm obviously sad that he died. Um, I do wish also that he spoke to us for the book. He opted not to. Um, we have tons of interviews with him from over the years, though, including um, a company called Prism Films uh, filmed four hours of interviews with him. So we we do have a lot of what he has to say, and and he's I think very well represented in the books. Um, but it would have been fun to talk to him, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's sad. Yeah, well, you know, I've had the pleasure of interviewing Danny a couple of times. And it's kind of ironic what you said there, Alan, about Band on the Run, that he felt like a utility player. Because in one of the interviews that I did, which was for a Beatles convention here in Connecticut, um, I was on stage with him and I asked him, you know, what was it like to do Ben on the Run? And and knowing that two of the members of your band had just quit, was it rough on the three of you? And he said, no, it was the most enjoyable experience that he had in Wings. I guess he felt that there was more freedom. He felt more liberated when it was just the three of them working on it, you know. <laughs> so he very often would kind of contradict himself. Yeah. 
when um, the Moody Blues were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and he was asked the question, do you think that Wing should be separate from Paul McCartney? And he kind of said that that it really was Paul's band. Um, it wasn't the same thing as the Moody Blues. And yet at the same time, I know he told me, like you just said, Alan, that Paul was always encouraging him to write in the group. It's funny, Alan, you, you just said that that Denny had a contract to write material for other people. And then he said that he doesn't really write all that much. <laughs> yeah. you know, so he was really enjoyable to talk to. He couldn't be more friendly to me. He always welcomed me every time that I saw him. And I, in fact, I saw him, uh, I think it was in June on Long Island. He was doing a tour where it was just him alone and his acoustic guitar. And it was kind of like a storyteller's approach going through all the songs of his career. He not only had the big hit with the Moody Blues with Go Now, but he also wrote a song called Say You Don't Mind. Yeah. Which, um, mm -hmm. Not only does he do in concert, but it was a big hit for Colin Blundstone of the Zombies in the UK. So he likes he liked to acknowledge that song too. And don't forget that before I Lie Around, he was doing a few songs with Wings live, uh, like I Would Only Smile, for example. Um, yeah, and when I think about Wings, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful in any way, shape, or form to the fourth and fifth members, because I love all the major lineups of Wings. They all had their own unique sound, their own unique style as guitarists and drummers. But Paul Lind and Denny was the nucleus of the band. And whenever yeah. I think of Wings, and again, no disrespect to the fourth and fifth members, there's that poster that accompanied Wings Greatest, which is just Paul, Linda, and Denny. And some, sometimes when I think overall about that decade, I think of the three of them. He was yeah. such a big part of their sound vocally in terms of harmonies. Very often we like to give credit here on this show to Linda for the harmonies in Wings which gave it a very distinctive sound, which you certainly felt was lacking later, especially as Linda contributed less vocally on Paul's albums. And, you know, after after she passed, we noticed a big difference. It's, a, you know, she was such a presence in that group. And when you combine Paul, Linda, and Denny vocally in their harmonies, that was a very important part of the sound of the group. Not to mention the songs that that Denny wrote or co-wrote in the band. And when you get to the London Town album in particular, there were, I think there were five songs that Paul and, and Denny wrote together, including Deliver Your Children, which was a big, it got a lot of airplay on rock radio at the time. Yeah. The title track to uh, London Town. And Don't Let It Bring You Down is yeah. one of his favorite songs from Wings. And that was one that they wrote together. Plus, more smooths than the Grey Goose, which was a pretty wacky song. And, uh, you know, I like to say that the concert that I saw in 76 at Madison Square Garden, the Wings Over America Tour, is still my favorite concert of all time. Wow. And apart from the fact that there were very big moments, I mean, Silly Love Songs was the number one song at the time. And, you know, a real crowd pleaser, but so was Time to Hide judging by the crowd there and time to high got a lot of airplay on rock radio as did just about every single song on wings at the speed of sound and that's an album that i like to cite because it was an important statement in a way that paul had every member of the group have a lead vocal to really establish the group as a band and even to the point that during the wings over america tour denny lane sang lead on five songs as much as I love the musicians of his band the last 20 years, when did they ever sing lead on any songs? It's all Paul. But in the days of Wings, he let Denny have lead vocals. He gave Jimmy McCulloch a lead vocal during that tour. Um, and Jimmy had a song on Wings at the Speed of Sound. But, you know, in terms of the vocal harmonies, the songwriting... And I've spoken to Lawrence Juber. I've done several interviews, as we have. He always brings up the folk element mm -hmm. yeah. Eddie Lane's music, which you can certainly <clears throat> see on the London Town album. But um, he was so much, he was a mainstay, you know. I just think of Paul Lind and Denny 
as being the the core members of that group. And I loved the other members through the years. They all contributed so much. But um, Denny Lane's contribution to, to Wings was immense. And I, I did see Denny quite a lot in concert. He did a tour where he played the entire Magnificent Moody Blues, Magnificent yeah. Moody's album. And then he also did the entire Band on the Run album. And I know that um, at that particular show that I went to, he had mentioned when I spoke to him that he was thinking about maybe doing a, an entire Back to the Egg show. Yeah. That would have been really cool. Yeah. But fact, uh, since we've men we've mentioned like every one of Denny's songs for Wings, except for again and again and again on Back <laughs> to the Egg. And that actually is probably my favorite of his songs. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like that it, one. It's a very, very... Yeah pretty song and it's uh it's 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 a little it's different from all his others and uh, I, I just like back to the egg a lot anyway i think it's uh i think it's an overlooked album underrated um but uh yeah and and the video for it is great too yeah and not only that when it came to paul trying to push wings as a band mm -hmm. and he also tried to make sure that the other members were interviewed he did have the entire band together um there were also moments not just counting the songs that denny lane wrote or co-wrote there were songs that paul wrote entirely by himself that he had denny uh sing lead vocals to or share lead vocals like the note he never wrote yeah. um oh spirits of ancient that's egypt another, that's another favorite of mine note you never wrote yeah so you know he also sang the vocals originally on getting closer yeah there's that bootleg of that yeah yeah it, in fact it wasn't until very late in the process that um that paul replaced it with his own vocal and denny's yeah. is pretty good denny's is perfect you know I mean, we we all have the bootleg it's 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 perfectly good performance anyway yeah. but uh you know what a tremendous loss we're all feeling it here in the beat. Mm, definitely. And I would only smile, which you mentioned, Ken. Another one of my favorites. Um, it was released, but for a long time was unreleased. And I still don't know how that did not. Well, we know we know what happened with the Red Rose Speedway album. And it was one of the songs that got lopped from it. But that was one that was like, I don't know how that didn't turn up as the B-side of a future single, or um, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous song. I would only smile. Yeah, and I was just thinking of Picasso's last words, which Denny started the song on lead vocals. Right. You know, yeah, his presence is there throughout the whole run of Wings, so yep. he will be sorely missed. So to continue with more news, Paul and his band just did a concert in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in which he dedicated the song Jet to Denny Lane. Nice. And after the song was finished, the crowd chanted Denny's name. By the way, Paul played his last show of those that were scheduled for his Got Back tour in Brazil at uh, Maracanã Stadium in rio de janeiro let's hope that uh we start to hear some new dates very soon It'd be nice if we heard about some u.s dates uh for next year keep our fingers crossed for that <clears throat> now not long after our last show it was announced that in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the release of band on the run paul is putting a special edition out to mark the occasion with three releases, a one LP half speed mastered vinyl, also a two LP with the original album and an underdub mix, which includes two Linda McCartney posters, also a two CD version, which includes a double sided fold out Polaroid poster taken by Linda. And for all the versions of the album, uh, they do include Helen Wheels, whereas the underdub versions on the LP and the CD do not. And to get a taste of what this is all about, these underdub mixes, you can listen to the mix of the song, Band on the Run, on YouTube. 
The second half of the song is a completely different performance of the song, including uh, different lead vocals from Paul. Very interesting. I was kind of shocked. I thought it would be the exact same version without the horns, the brass, you know, orchestration and all that, but it's not. The beginning is, but uh, that was a surprise. So maybe the rest of this underdub mix will be kind of like that. And last Monday, it was announced that for The Collector on Friday, December 15th, another release regarding Paul's last album, McCartney 3. In celebration of its third anniversary, it's the 3 by 3 edition. It's a limited edition release that amounts to three uniquely tricolored LPs with a handwritten print by Paul. All the copies feature new cover artwork, plus an Ed Rusha sketch poster, plus a variant selected at random for each purchase. I haven't seen it offered on Amazon just yet, but if you order it through Paul's website, there's a limit of four per customer. Okay? Good um, ask. Darren's been waiting for more McCartney 3. He can't get enough of it. I bought two copies. <laughs> uh, which which kind of, I don't know anyone. Personally, I haven't spoken to anyone else that, that purchased it. I've seen things on social media. And on more than, more than one occasion, the, the person who bought, I think, the Max, the four copies, ended up with the same edition four times. Um, so I, I didn't open mine. I I said to myself, I'm not going to even attempt to try to get all. He says that now. Check back yeah. in six months. Um, just to, I just wanted to have the just because I you got got to have everything and got to have my, my head examined too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it came in the mail on Saturday, day after. Uh day after the so-called release yeah i have a feeling on my other podcast a few of those uh, co-hosts will have bought several of them and they're supposed to be handwritten lyrics to uh pretty boys and also the kiss of venus I yes well capital capital wouldn't have been would it have been capital yeah i think so sent out and i was received one in the mail um one of the printouts with no real explanation what this was. I got this big cardboard envelope in the mail. Um, and it was just a piece of paper and it had a printout of the kiss of Venus, um, lyrics and the flip side of the uh, card was a, um, a QR QR code. Is it? Okay. Yeah. QR code. And when you, um, click the QR. Did the whatever you do with it. Um, just, when you put the A track in, it <laughs> plays. Sometimes the third program first. Uh, I did the QR code thingy, and it just took you to, uh, like a part of the website, and it didn't say much of anything. Hmm. And then a day or two later, uh, the McCartney three by three edition was coming out. So. It was a little anticlimactic. I thought, ooh, what was I getting here? I did. I, I will admit, I did look at it first closely. Do you think Paul actually wrote this? No, nah, it's printed. Uh, but it was a kiss of sheet the, with the kiss of Venus lyrics. Just that and uh, had the QR code on the flip. So that was the way it sort of announced. Okay. It's it nice coming. that you got even that. Yeah. Okay, more McCartney news here. One of the major releases for Beatle fans this past year was Paul's book of photos from his private collection called Eyes of the Storm, drawing on photos of the Beatles from November 1963 through February 1964, as Beatlemania was about to sweep the U.S. and the world. And now an exhibit of these photos will be running at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia. Featuring 275 of Paul's photographs and additional essays by Harvard historian and New Yorker essayist Jill Lepore, director of the National Portrait Gallery Nicholas Culinan, and senior curator Rosie Broadley. Video footage is also included in this exhibit, 
which is described as an immersive experience capturing the Beatles from their perspective at performances in Liverpool and London and in New York at the Ed Sullivan Show. Admission to the museum is free. The exhibit is running now through April 7th. Some exciting news coming from Gary Burr, who has, for a long time, been working with Ringo Starr. From back with Ringo's time with Mark Hudson and many of his albums after Hudson, Gary wrote a song that will be on Ringo's next EP, which has right. heard will be his country EP. And he says it's due out in March. Hmm. Gary's wife, singer-songwriter Georgia Middleman, along with Mike Noble and Larry Paxton, will be on the song. Ringo said, it's a great song with a great band, and I couldn't be more excited. So, March, we should have Ringo's next EP. And by the way, if you don't know it, Gary was a fantastic guest on our yep. show, talking about his career and his work with Ringo. Be sure to check that out if you haven't had a chance to do so. Ringo is also on the front cover of the December-January issue of AARP magazine. <clears throat> Only me and Alan are qualified to get that magazine at the moment. but I'm too young. <laughs> uh, recently, I reported on a major Yoko Ono art retrospective uh, running next year at the Tate Modern in London from February 15th to se September 1st. Well, there will be a book in association with the Tate due out March 24th next year called Yoko Ono, Music of the Mind. This handsome volume traces Ono's career across continents, beginning with the artist's early work in Tokyo. Ono's time in 1960s London is also centered, and the survey looks critically at the development of her work in that period against the more public specter of her relationship with John Lennon and the Beatles. The book then focuses a wider lens on Odo's transnational networks, including her impact on continental Europe and her extended residency in New York. Throughout her career in each of these places, Ono championed feminist, anti-war, and environmental ideas that have only grown in relevance. Drawing on key themes of audience participation, play, and music, the book also employs Ono's own words to encourage readers to, to experience Ono's work through actions that she finds particularly resonant. That's reading, enacting, imagining, and wishing. Again, that's called Yoko Ono Music of the Mind, the book due out March 24th next year. Uh, you may have heard about this. Sean Ono Lennon has teamed up with Pixar alumnus Dave Mullins to create a new short animated film for the Christmas classic Happy Christmas War is Over, which will also use Peter Jackson's visual effects company called Weta FX. The Hollywood Reporter says that back in 2021, Sean was looking for a way to make a music video for Happy Christmas. And because the song is more than a Christmas song, it's also a peace anthem, he wanted it to get more treatment than the airplay on radio and playlists. He wanted to reintroduce the song's message. The song, he says, just felt like it deserved some kind of peace to help get it out there for another generation. The only problem was that every music video idea seemed to trivialize it. It almost felt goofy, like a Hallmark kind of thing. What are we going to show? A family sitting around a fire? It needed an actual narrative, he says. And when talking on Zoom, Sean and Mullins hit upon the idea, you'll enjoy this, of the Christmas truce that happened between the Germans and British soldiers during World War I when they stopped fighting during the holiday and played impromptu games of soccer. Does that sound familiar to you? Uh, yeah. Hey, Sean, ever heard of Pipes of Peace? <laughs> Paul McCartney, ever seen the video for Pipes of Peace? Well, the film, which has been finished, is called War is Over, inspired by the music of John and Yoko, and it concerns a chess game played against enemy lines with the help of a heroic carrier pigeon the animated film is 11 minutes long it's already had an oscar qualifying run and at the moment it's looking for a distributor hopefully we'll know more about that soon a few more items here on our last show i reported that the weaklings the power pop band that records many of the lesser known rarer Beatles songs and mixes those 
with their original Beatles songs. We'll have a new album coming out January 19th called Raspberry Park, in which they'll cover two Beatles songs. Now we hear that the group will be performing at the upcoming Beatles on the Beach Rock Festival, taking place January 24th through the 28th at the Delray Beach Amphitheater in Florida. And the Weaklings will be opening for Cheap Trick. Pretty cool. cool. Also, the Fab Faux will also be among the headliners. For more information, go to BeatlesOnTheBeach.com. Now, for Badfinger fans, listen up to this. This Thursday, there will be a new release of Pete Ham Demos. The collection is called Gwent Gardens, and it will include 18 demos made by Pete, just himself with either an acoustic guitar or piano. 14 of the songs are for demos that have never been released before, and it will only be made available digitally. You can pre-order this release now on Apple Music, and it will be available for downloading and for streaming on December 21st. One of the songs called Love Will Be is uh, now on YouTube, so you can preview one of the songs, Love Will Be. So this is kind of different than what's been done before, taking Pete Ham's demos and having a, a backup band to accompany it. This is just Pete with a guitar, Pete with a piano, nothing else. Special thanks to Tom Brennan for that information. You might remember not that long ago, I mentioned here on this show that Mark Hudson made an announcement on his Facebook page about a Hudson Brothers reunion that they were going to give a concert in October, and that it would be streamed. Well, here's an update. They're supposed to be getting a new website soon, and they are planning live dates in March next year. So as soon as we hear something more definitive, we'll pass that along to you, since I know a lot of Beatles fans love the Hudson Brothers and Mark Hudson's work through the years, especially with Ringo. Also, I should say that the Fest for Beatles fans is coming up very soon, February 9th through the 11th at TWA Hotel in New York. And they just added Mickey Dolans as a guest, star-studded cast there for uh, for the Fest coming up well, for those three dates, February 9th through the 11th. Check out thefest.com for more information. And finally, what's going on on the charts, on the Billboard album charts? Dolly Parton's Rockstar, which debuted at number three, two weeks later is already down to number 51. It includes the new version of Lady Paul and Ringo on it. The Beatles, 1967 to 1970, number 77 after re-entering the charts at number 15. And 1962 to 1966 is already down to 116 after re-entering the charts at number 20. You know, you're kind of hoping that because it's a best of greatest hits that it will have staying power like it did originally when it first came out in 1973 or that the Beatles one did. Let's hope that's the case for the red and the blue collections. <laughs> and in the UK on the official singles chart, Happy Christmas is now on the charts there um, at number 21. Um, Wonderful Christmas Time is at number 25 and Now and Then is down to number 65 after being at number one, seven weeks on the charts. You know, I failed to mention the Billboard singles charts here because Wonderful Christmas Time is number 47 this week. Happy Christmas is not on the charts yet. Um, one more chart here in the UK, the official physical singles chart, which just concerns physical releases, LPs and CDs, uh, now and then, is still at number one there in the UK on that particular chart. And Rewind Forward, which, as I understand uh, from Ringo, it's the EP on the charts. It's not just the song. It's at number 49 on the charts after peaking at number four there. So Ringo's uh, EP doing fairly well in the UK after nine weeks on the charts. Okay. Okay, thanks, Ken. And um, before we head on to our uh, three guests, just a short word about Paul McCartney's Life and Lyrics podcast. I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney, reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, McCartney, A Life 
in lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, so here we are with the staff of the RPM School, uh, Walter Everett. Why don't you just wave? Uh, Jack Petroselli and Cameron Greider. If you could, some one of you could first just say what the RPM School is, and and then we'll. Jack. Yeah. Rock Pop Music School. It focuses on the music of the Beatles. Um, we've been doing it for two years now. Uh, started during the pandemic, and it was just a way to express our love and our interest in the Beatles music. For me, a um, member of the Fab Faux, I've been playing Beatles music for a number of years and studying it. And it's a school, an online school that's interactive, that has people learning specific parts, as well as discussing everything from songs to albums to cultural topics um, with the great Walter Everett, uh, who I have known through reading his books, The Beatles as Musicians. For me, it's a continuation of that study in depth of Beatles music. So whether you're a fan or whether you're a musician and just want to talk or learn more about the music, that's what we do. And we get together uh, for a few semesters a year on Monday nights from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Eastern time. And we have our winter semester coming up that starts on January 8th for eight consecutive Mondays on the White Album. Um, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Maybe just also tell people how to um, get in, how to how to sign up for this if they want to. Where do they you go? Can, yeah, well, you can go to RPM um, RPM hyphen hyphen school. yeah hyphen school. Well, maybe we could send you that link at the end. But it's RPM School, uh, the music you love. Learn the music you love. Uh, if you just Google that, you'll find it. You'll find us um, online. Okay, so now we're, we're going to see um, sort of a sample of your White Album presentation, and, and which of you is going to start? Was it Walter? Yeah, um, I, I thought we'd uh, uh, talk about one of uh, George Harrison's less heralded songs from the White Album, Piggies. Um, it's, it's well known that George Orwell's satirical 1946 uh, fable, Animal Farm, with its totalitarian hierarchy of gluttonous pigs, particularly Napoleon, if you know the book, uh, ruling the rest of the barnyard. It was the immediate source of imagery for piggies. But I will suggest that the inspiration might have been closer to home in a similar but more subtle way than shown in Taxman. For a good ironic clash of aristocracy and vermin, to use a topical descriptor. Uh, we have musical suggestions of both in Piggies. The former uh, aristocracy is perfectly captured by the regal harpsichord played by then producer Chris Thomas. And uh, this was recorded during the month that George Martin took his vacation from the Beatles. Uh, so Chris Thomas was uh, recording uh, the band. and, and uh, Thomas plays the harpsichord, which opens uh, with... Right? Um, uh, Alan, you and I both talked with uh, Chris Thomas about this performance. Do you remember his thoughts about the session? Um, not really that much. I mean, the one thing I remember from that conversation is him telling me about carrying the harpsichord into the room with George and George playing him something on the harpsichord, uh, which he was working on at the time. So, um, but I, I don't remember what he said that much about piggies. Right, right. Well, all four of the Beatles were working in Studio Two as usual. Um, but the harpsichord was set up in Studio One and he probably had to move it to rearrange uh, seating for everybody, but um, they couldn't take the harpsichord out of that studio because it was scheduled to be used for a classical recording later that that day, or the next day, I guess. Um, so the Beatles moved from Studio Two to Studio One, and that's probably why Ringo's uh, playing tambourine on the basic track 
because his uh, set was still set up in Studio Two. Um, so uh, also, you know, in thinking about the, the harpsichord for the aristocracy angle uh, being used in an ironic way, uh, you could also think of, uh, you know, a related piece in, in the use of strings by Stevie Wonder in Village Ghetto Land, right? It's a very similar 18th century milieu court, you know, arist aristocratic European court sound for, for that, for, you know, social uh, commentary. So there, there are musical uh, references to the riffraff and uh, we'll come back to that in a bit, but let's further investigate the uh, aristocratic salon. Um, the verse is very simple, inoffensive, as would be expected at court, right? No, no jarring conversation permitted. Uh, so very easygoing, uh, inoffensive uh, sounds. The diatonic scale in A flat major, as it works out, um, it, it's arranged in a in a sing-songy uh, sequences, in sing-songy sequences of descending thirds that come off like a, a nursery rhyme. Right, so the, um, that's what I mean by sequences, you play a third you repeat a third, but lower, and then you repeat a third, lower uh, again. Um, it's simple to the point of being insipid. And at this point, I, I can raise the question of, you know, with whom does Harrison really have a beef? It's not the aristocrats on the continent, right? This is more subtle than only a Northern song in which he skewered the beneficiaries of his composing, Lennon and McCartney, who took the lion's share of songwriting royalties, even of songs written by Harrison prior to March 1968. I propose that Piggies is a dig at his two most domineering older Beatle brothers, John and Paul. The sequence is a favorite melodic device of McCartney's. Witness uh, the early love of the loved, it's all just uh, sequences of thirds. Uh, there's a third, there's a third, there's a third, third, and we end with, uh, with another third there. Or more recently, uh, from late 67. Right. So it's these uh, thirds that are, are very, you know, McCartney is very at home in simple diatonic scale expressed in sequences of thirds. Um, the latter song, Hello Goodbye, of course, was uh, trash talked by Lennon uh, on the record um, as being an inconsequential ditty, uh, not worthy of A-side status with, with Walrus uh, right there next to it, right? Uh, Taxman complained about uh, the British government's tax schedule Northern song about Lennon and McCartney's financial domination, and Piggies then, much slyer than either of these, roasts an unknowing pair of bandmates, to my ear, for their musical and social dictatorship. And the manuscript of Piggies ends, uh, by the way, uh, with an unused verse that returns to the theme of finances, talking about their piggy banks, right? A very clever little turn there that uh, Harrison not used. Um, so the bottom line of my underlying thesis then is that all Beatles are equal, but some are more equal than others. Right? <laughs> um, Lennon, by the way, um, could also write sequences. Uh, the irony in Nowhere Man is that the subject is supposedly very clearly, or, or, or the subject is supposedly aimless, 
uh, while the tune and the harmony point in a strongly progressive direction very clearly through sequences, right? Uh, I'll play the bass down here. There's a falling third, rising third, falling third, 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 just thirds down the scale, a very McCartney-esque uh, melody, actually. Um, and if you listen at Harrison's guitar solo for Nowhere Man, um, the, it, it, it's a tune that was dictated by George Martin. He just takes that idea of descending sequences and inverts it. So in Nowhere Man, the melody goes up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, and then in the guitar solo, it's down, up, down, up. It reverses the direction down, up, down, up uh, that... Um, that um, uh, that Lennon had sung in the uh, in the verse, and and Chris Thomas does the same thing in uh, Piggies. He does the harpsichord uh, solo. Um, <laughs> right. So there's down, 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 where it's, the melody. had been all rising thirds, Chris Thomas inverts it, just like uh, George Martin had Harrison do in, uh, in uh, Nowhere Man. So, you know, there are reasons why Beatles sound like Beatles. There are these little subtle things that uh, you may not be consciously aware of, but unite the whole, the whole uh, enterprise. So that, that's the verse of Piggies. And a wrenching modulation takes us from the A, a flat verse to the bridge uh, through that transitional uh, C7 chord, right? The. Um, uh, right, that, that jarring change from the E flat to the E natural there is what gets us into the new realm in the bridge. It takes us from the polite conversation to the transgression and angry punishment that's suggested in the bridge. First, strident, whacking staccato triads in regular rhythm in the muddy lower strings uh, that, em that uh, emphasize an ungrammatical augmented second. So like... <laughs> The strings down here are really muddy, even muddier than suggested by this harpsichord, um, much more than they would be in the upper register, just because of the way acoustics works with all the, the overtones that come out of those low fundamentals. They all jumble up much more than would happen if they were played up here. So the, you hear him getting down in the mud in the, in the pigsty there. And that augmented second, that interval there, very uh, ungrammatical and, and uh, probably ugly to, to many ears, right? So it sets up a very different tone uh, for, for the bridge. Um, through this, George's vocal melody has another inversion of the rising thirds. Right, forgetting forgetting what chord I'm I'm playing there, but more descending thirds as opposed to the ascending thir thirds of of the original melody, right? Uh, it, and he's singing here in their styes with all their backing. Uh, what is the backing? <laughs> I don't really know. Is it the ramshackle siding that surrounds the piggies that allows its in inhabitants to ignore what goes on around? Or does it refer to the financial or other support that only Messrs. Lennon and McCartney enjoy? 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the backing is supposed to be. And I never heard anybody talk about that. The self-satisfied, broadly blasé line, they don't care what goes on around, right? It takes us back to the elegance through the haughty cadential 6-4. The cadential 6-4 is this, this idea here, which, you know, it's very redolent of the 18th century. In fact, there's a spot in Love is Here and Now You're Gone, the Supremes track where they use a cadential 6-4 just a, on a harpsichord setting. Just a beautiful, beautiful suggestion of that elegance. Um, right, it's a very constrained sound because you got this particularly this sound that must resolve down there. So um, there's that elegance from the verse that's referred to in the... Right, and and what is that answered by? It's it's uh, answered by the, the you know this this ugly uh, sound that uh, George Martin writes for the strings for the lower. <laughs> hmm? What was that? Somebody say something. Nope. Just my imagination, hearing voices, I guess, um, and that reminds it's it's ungrammatical that d flat in this in this uh in this uh e flat uh scenario and then that ungrammatical g flat what that does is it gives us the minor pentatonic scale that contrast completely in a very bluesy way against the major scale that dominates or the chromatic scale that that's uh, suggested uh, in there. And that um, reminds me very much of yesterday. Uh, you may know the story that uh, cello line uh, when Martin heard McCartney play that on guitar and was working out the string arrangement you know McCartney says we'll, we'll give that to the cello Martin says no 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 you can't use that E flat there Bach would never write that Bach it's the flat seven he, he, Bach would never do that so McCartney of course said well we have to do that because McCartney wants his fingerprint on, on the song, right? So that's what sticks out in, in Yesterday. And when Martin's scoring the strings for Piggies, it just, it, it, it's even a bluesier sound than uh, Martin got in, um, in, uh, in, in Yesterday. Um, Let's see, we can skip a lot of the ideas uh, um, that I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Um, do you know who came up with the entire harpsichord part? I mean, I know that it's following the melody of the song, but there's so much that it adds, all, all the different parts, all the different, um, I guess they're eighth notes, um, in the song and leading into the last verse, was that George's, um, was that all from George's mind? Was it Chris Thomas? Did George Martin play a part in any of that or, or what? Uh, George Martin wasn't around. Uh, you know, he came back at the end of September after all the basic tracks and even all the vocals, everything had been recorded for Piggies. Ringo's drums were added to the to the track, three vocal parts from George. Um, only then did Martin even hear the song. So he's not part of the equation except for the string arrangement, which he did. Um, you know, I've never seen any documentation of this, so we only have speculation. And the usual situation would be for the person who's playing or singing is generally the person who's devised the part. Now, 
George might very well, George Harrison might very well have suggested this or that to Chris Thomas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, I, I bet it's probably, you know, Tr uh, Thomas was a very accomplished and, and seasoned uh, keyboardist. So, um, yeah, it was Chris, Chris Thomas was on Robert Rodriguez's uh, podcast a while back, and, and he had mentioned that that was his idea. And ah. He just ran with it. And it goes into Chris Thomas had uh, studied at the Royal Academy of Music School when he was a kid. So, you know, he doesn't go on about having a lot of chops, but he certainly had knowledge of how to get around on the instrument. Right. Yeah. And it's not just a matter of playing, you know, any old keyboard part. But like you said, the, the, the uh, fast notes... <laughs> that kind of thing in the solo, it works on harpsichord in ways that it would never work on the organ, for instance. Ooh. It just, you know, he's familiar with the qualities of that particular uh, keyboard. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, Harrison was right there and of course contributing. Um, mm -hmm. McCartney was there playing bass. He might've had ideas. Would he ever, contribute ideas to a George Harrison song? Uh, I think he would. So, <laughs> um, yeah. it, it, we, don't, we just don't know, Ken. Don't, don't really know. Walter, I have but a also, comment or an observation. Um, yeah. I had never, it, it never occurred to me that Piggies might be George singing about John and Paul. I mean, I, I can see why you're saying it and how it works. And it makes me think that maybe... <laughs> maybe not guilty was kind of a uh, decoy. He was getting them to do not guilty 102 takes, yeah. knowing that it wasn't going to get on the album. But this one is like the stealth commentary. That was <laughs> exactly. Just, yeah. A zinger that uh, they didn't even see go by, you know? Um, yeah, obviously this is speculation, but, you know, you think about, who Harrison has problems with and he, always being in John and Paul's shadow, uh, you know, everything he had to endure, right? It's the, the, the situation is uh, the, the, the uh, you know, the um, instances of his being put in, in his place or legion. So uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I think, you know, John and Paul were the aristocrats of the group, right? They were the they were the, the front line. Um, George had to poke his head in to get into that front line, even in the early days, right? <laughs> uh, which, to share a microphone with Paul or whatever in the, in the, in the early days. Okay, I wanna run to, oh, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, the idea just to use the harpsichord in the That's song. That's what I was just gonna ask. Yeah, was that Chris Thomas's yeah. idea or, or George's? I would not be surprised. I, I mean, we can, we can speculate that, okay, George has this song that he's demonstrating on acoustic guitar mm. that seems to portray uh, high society in the guise of pigs, right? And it, we don't know how the idea might have come about to, oh, well, let's make this a very refined kind of atmosphere. That might very well have been George's idea. And then Thomas, oh, you know, I wish we had a harpsichord. Oh, oh, there's one next door. Again, just a total guess. Um, and I feel less confident in that than my total guess that it's George being pissed off at, at his older brothers, you know, Beatle brothers. Um, yeah. Mike, I, I have a question about uh, the fact that the Beatles were not trained musicians. They couldn't read or write music. And these ideas that they may have had, they probably didn't even know what they were. Of course. These ideas and then needed to have, whether it be in this case, Chris Thomas or George Martin, there at their side to go, you know, I know I've heard Paul say that he'd hear things in his head. Oh, well, try this. And these ideas would come out. Um, 
it makes me wonder, gee, if they were trained musically. Their training <laughs> came in in covering hundreds of songs written by others. And they got in their bones, they got all these relationships in terms of what instruments do, how, how vocal parts work, how um, melody is constructed, how formal relationships work, how chords work together to form harmonic sections. It was all unconscious, but it was in their bones. And so when they started writing music, they just had that to work from. And, you know, uh, John laughed about Aeolian cadences, sounds like uh, exotic birds to me, right? But, you know, they are Aeolian cadences, whether he knew they were or not. Uh, McCartney in, in latter decades has been very interested in learning some terminology for the things that excite him. Um, he's talked in interviews about musical relationships in a pretty sophisticated way, um, whereas he never could have been bothered with learning words for things because the, the Beatles could communicate with nods and you know gestures. They didn't need to know the names of things. So they weren't musically trained as most popular is it true most popular musicians the last say 150 years or so 130 years anyway um but uh yeah it's uh, i mean they they play beautiful stuff they write beautiful stuff uh, mm -hmm. because that's where their heads are um yeah so i just want to wrap up with the coda of of piggies here so in the in the ending the tonic identity is questioned right <laughs> The A flat major turns to, to A flat minor, which totally casts a shadow over, you know, the the area that's been governing uh, the whole track. Um, let's see, I had some I had some thoughts worked out here. Yeah, so um, right in the in the coda you have. <laughs> And that that um, takes the, the the floor out from under the tonic from the the governing A flat rule. Suddenly, A flat is not uh, all all ruling anymore. Uh, in fact, in fact, that chord actually helps lead to a new tonic. This is now E flat is now the new tonic, and it's set up with with that augmented second <laughs> that was so ugly in the bridge. The augmented second comes in at the end of Piggies to proclaim E flat as, as the new tonic, and so uh, E flat is no longer the fifth scale degree; it's the first. The tables have been turned. Uh, Harrison comes out from behind his oppressors to, to defeat them. The dark horse wins. Uh, the, the, but, but, but wait, one more time, right? One more time, and then we get the off-key strings. Uh, <laughs> right? With, oh, E-flat may be tonic, but it's going to be... Uh, the, eminence doesn't matter right we just you know we can have these these random ideas uh and and really you know these random ideas are equal to each other george harrison is saying you know no one is going to dominate here everyone is as good as everyone else um and that third based elegance you know a descending third decorating that that e major uh, try it brings us to the drawing room uh, to to close things uh, close things out. So that and then the grunting tape collage that Lennon uh, put together. That's his one contribution uh, to the track. Um, and then it, it it reminds me of the way that Harrison has the laughs at the end of Within You Without You, kind of taking the edge off the seriousness. I, I think that that ending there um, 
with the grunts sounds very much like that to me. And also, you know, a little bit like uh, George Martin's honky tonk piano at the end of Tomorrow Never Knows. How does that fit? How yeah. does that close revolver? You know, it just it just laughs at the seriousness there, uh, laughs at the pretensions. And uh, so that's very much George, I think, sneering at, you know, the Beatles. And, uh, and that's, that's how I hear the end of Piggies there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my take on, on Piggies. Very interesting. That was, that was great, Walt. You know, and, and, and any analysis that you've done in any of our classes um, always, always entertained and learned so much about not only what's happening musically, but, you know, you're almost like Gore Vidal writing li about Lincoln. You know, it's like because you you're piecing this together in a way. And Darren had asked the question about the musicianship and you know, the Beatles having George Martin, obviously, as Walt had said, with Nowhere Man, you know, or Chris Thomas, like, these guys are trained musicians, right? So they're hearing a piece of music. And as a producer, when you hear a piece of music, you want to embellish what's there, or you want to try to um, not correct what's there, but you want to solve the puzzle. And in music, you know, you have motion you have parallel motion you have similar motion you have contrary motion you have oblique motion um the counterpoint that exists in the beatles in beatles music and pop music is is some of the best and you know walt you have a way of breaking it down that just brings me such joy because i love to see and understand how it works musically but then you're also like this fly on the wall of like is it about John and Paul? You know, Alan had asked that question. Obviously, you know, there's the George Orwell connection there. Um, was that harpsichord a coincidence or was it planned ahead? You know, it's all of these factors that come together that make this music as rich as it is. And I really appreciate your, your academic viewpoint on that. Really beautiful. Yeah, the, the harpsichord just could have been a happy accident. And how many times... Did the Beatles have an accident and and latch onto it? Right. Yeah, completely, and, completely and with it. Yeah. Very much, very what, much part of their are gene. Are there other Beatles songs with harpsichord prior to that, aside from "Fixing a Hole"? That's it, and and you know the 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 harpsichord wind up piano in in my life uh, that effect, but yeah, um, the, the similar eighteenth century drawing room kind of effect that George right. Martin and a Paul song. And I think there's also a little bit of a connection to the sort of social complaint of that song, because he's complaining about all of these kind of, I don't know if they're busybody outsiders and maybe official people who are sort of telling him what to do. Fixing a hole. Yeah. Fixing a hole, right? Hmm. I, was, I was also thinking about that in connection with, you know, we were talking about the Bernard Cribbins song. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it called? Digging a hole. Hmm. Dig that hole or digging a hole. The song that George Martin produced. Oh. It's a song that's kind of. It's this musical. This music hall uh, guy Bernard Cribbins, who's an actor and musical theater guy, and then the song he's like a Cockney fellow who's who's digging a hole, and this posh guy comes up and and says, "Would you mind a few suggestions? Don't dig it there." Dig it over, you know, dig it elsewhere. You're making it round, it ought to be square. And um, and the workman ends up burying him in the hole at the end. You know, he's like sick of it. <laughs> Doesn't want to hear it anymore after a while. Hole, hole in the ground. Hole in the ground, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So do, should we go to uh, Blackbird then? Why One of the, yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, you know, January 15th being King Day, uh, it's a, a Monday and we're going to have a class that day. We wanted to focus on civil rights for that class. And um, in late 1968, you know, McCartney was producing Mary Hopkins' album Postcard um, right after the White Album came, up, came out. Um, and he was working with Donovan, who contributed three songs and played guitar on, on the album. Um, 
<laughs> in there with the Gershwins and Irving Berlin and, <laughs> and uh, Lesser and Low, uh, the Honeymoon song, the things that McCartney really wanted her to sing. He had Donovan come in and, and contribute some songs. So in taped conversations, we hear Paul and Donovan talking about Blackbird. And uh, McCartney says that it was... Uh, written with black women in mind. He mentions Diane Ross in a joking way, but uh, that's pretty much the end of the conversation. But um, in later years, McCartney has talked about um, the Little Rock Nine uh, being an inspiration, the uh, young uh, black uh, girl uh, going into school, a segrega previously segregated school with Marshall's accompanying her. Um, and uh, I, I totally believe McCartney um, had this in mind in 1968. <coughs> a uh, very esteemed colleague of mine, Katie Kapursh, has written this book, Blackbird. Let me see if I can get it showing there. There we go. Um, about the song and its relation to uh, black musicians, and uh, the the uh, how uh, the Beatles' music interacts with black musicians, both who came before them and who have covered uh, their their song. It's a, it's a brilliant book, but she takes exception to this idea. She thinks McCartney is padding his resume uh, with. Um, the, the revisionist history. <laughs> so anyway, however you take it, um, it's easy to hear the song as the portrayal of the rise of black pride in 1968, which involved demands for political and financial power in a corrupt caste system and an embrace of African roots in such expression as black history and literature the natural Afro hairstyle, dress, and soul music, not called R&B anymore. Um, and, and then the protest at the Summer Olympics in Mexico City in October of 68, and the great delegation of blacks elected to the U.S. Congress that November represented something of an early peak of black pride and mainstream calls for black power. Of course, this rise coincided with the rise of violence and the deaths of dozens across 130 American cities uh, that required the unleashing of 60,000 federal troops and National Guardsmen following the April 68 murder of uh, Dr. King. Black struggle is portrayed in Blackbird, I think musically, and Cameron's going to help me out here with uh, some of the musical effects that I'll talk about. Um, the song opens uh, very serenely in perfectly consonant parallel tense to get at that parallel motion uh, Jack mentioned, um, which can be heard as the solo voice leading. Parallel tense just move. Parallel sixths and tenths just want to move very fluidly. So Cameron, can you uh, play the just the introduction of uh, Blackbird? Sure. Right. So the tenths run. We're getting them on harpsichord now. Those are there's a tenth, another tenth, another tenth. Parallel tenths all the way up to that that high tenth there, and then this leads to the struggle of broken wings and sunken eyes, perfect images for the violent backlash against uh, black activists. McCartney turns from the consonant major scale to harsh chromaticism and a voice leading technique called reaching over. So uh, Cameron, can you play from that C chord just up through the chromatic rise to the E minor? Okay. Right. Made that a little extra harsh. In <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, we don't need to talk about <laughs> my keyboard playing, yeah, for, for that. Yeah, I get that uh, uh, plenty. So you know, we started with, you know, very consonant parallel tense, and they continue. But 
instead of those gentle, beautiful, serene parallel tints, McCartney uh, moves instead of directly, he moves through a chromatic note and through another chromatic note, and he ends up where those tenths might have gone, but through a, a struggle in those chromatic pitches that barely inch their way up, just like pulling themselves up. And the upper voice in the guitar has a very different technique going on called reaching over. Um, so we have this tenth, and then we want to go there. We want to go to this tenth. And we, instead of going directly to that F sharp, the guitar goes up to G and then falls, reaching over and reaching over again. Uh, it's sort of like the opposite of that French idiom, reculer pour mieux sauter, which means to take a step back to get a better jump forward. In this case, we're reaching up, we're jumping up as high as we can to get a stable landing, and we come down to that stable landing. So there's the harsh chromaticism there, and above that, the struggle of the reaching over to try to get to that place of flying and freedom uh, that um, the protagonist is, is yearning for. Um, so um, then acquiescence seems to set in as if energies run out, as if, oh, we can't make it, or this is not the time to be reaching uh, for this. The struggle is, is so fierce, uh, it's, and there's this backlash, right? One must wait for the proper moment to rise, to fly, and to achieve freedom. So the original repose is thus regained with, you know, in a, in a tired way, with a chromatic fall to the cadence. So uh, Cameron, can you um, demonstrate what happens? From, from that E minor, that we have the chromatic descent mm -hmm. that falls. Yeah, and that, that chromatic descent uh, coming in the... Uh, um, Darren, you were asking about the Beatles not being literate musicians, but you know this is just it's brilliant writing because you have what's called imitation at the octave. You have uh, a line right that and then you get that an octave higher imitated in the upper part. Right, both the, the bass line moves down that full chromatic scale, and then the upper voice moves down in exactly the same, just an octave higher. But it's, it's draining, it's a draining, falling acquiescence, uh, just like the bottom comes out and this is not the time to rise but it's in the bridge oh question no no i said mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so it's in the bridge that um black pride is revealed and really blooms musically it begins on the flat side which many bridges do going back for the beatles all the way to uh from me to you from then on they experimented with bridges that begin on the flat side and by the flat side i mean taking a scale that's the home scale for the song and uh flat flatting some pitches so instead of that third we're going to use that pitch and instead of that seventh degree we're gonna so we're gonna use we're gonna stay in g but we're gonna use b flat and f in in uh 
in in this uh, skate in this key. Actually, it sort of is the pitches of a C mixolydian scale, if you're following, uh, <laughs> if you're keeping score. Um, but uh, what it does is it flattens the uh, the um, overall tonal uh, milieu that we're in. So Cameron, can you play the first phrase of the bridge uh, so we can hear the, the change from, and see if we can hear the, the B flats and the Fs in there. Yeah, especially that F natural. F natural, and then, and this is how McCartney gets back home, uh, and and by giving us a B natural that takes us home. But right in there, we get the F and the B flat that that take us out of the tonal language of the of the the um, verse, and then the second phrase of the bridge, I I hear it internalizing the B flat and the F in uh, imagining that McCartney, the singer, uh, has taken a flying lesson and he now can soar in the second part of the bridge where he has the improvisatory uh, line. Cameron, can you sing and play the second phrase of the bridge? Yeah, sure. So. Black into the light of the dark black night right and so that it's it's that minor pentatonic scale that we talked about with piggies and of course this is this is black language this is soul music this is black pride bursting forth in a way that the singer could not in the major mode or with all that chromatic struggle suddenly you know the 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 minor pentatonic scale which is like you know it's often harmonized in soul music uh throughout the 60s and and beyond um but but it's 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 very african american uh in fact it appears in lots of early Beatles, like think of the refrain and I saw her standing there. It's just Lennon coming down that, that uh, minor pentatonic scale. Wilfred Mellers, who wrote the first great analysis of the Beatles in 1973 in a book called um, Twilight of the Gods, of all things, um, uh, he he calls that the tumbling strain and talks about its African ancestry. Um, that that uh, that phrase. So that kind of thing. Just kind yeah, of like exactly. And it's it's just blues, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's it's so so yeah. big a part of of blues. Um, so th that that spot at the end of the bridge, that's where improvised melismas, uh, you know, vocal improvisation would always fly and the Beatles would contain that in a woo or you know falsetto uh, singing or think of um, uh, what you're doing McCartney has a beautiful a cappella uh, melisma at the end of the bridge right so that's that's where everything breaks loose and it's at that point in Blackbird that the that the singer can fly and and finds the freedom that they had been uh, working for earlier. Um, so um, so there's there's a little bit uh, of what we're going to talk about on Martin Luther King Day. Um, cool. I, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to ask. Uh, I'm sure you've seen McCartney in concert when he does Blackbird. Um, often he brings up the fact that he and George Harrison used to practice this Bach piece. Wasn't it called Beret? Yeah. He would Beret. play it on stage. Do you hear that in Blackbird? Do you hear the influence in that song? You know, I was just, just, Go ahead. yeah, I was just going to just demonstrate that because getting back to this academic view on the Beatles and 
where they might have gotten some of these ideas that is absolutely correct. When George and Paul were kids, they learned Borini Minor. <laughs> all tense. So I think McCartney definitely at that point learned how to work intervals with the guitar. And of course, McCartney being who he is and was at that time, you know, took that as an inspiration and just went with it. Yeah, also I think his version was simpler and probably more like Blackboard because he didn't learn all that complicated stuff that you just played, right? He played it like this. Um, and then he finished off the phrase, right? So if you take that... That part of it, which it kind of really isn't even in the Bach. Right. It's. I think it's even more, even closer. Yeah. Comparison. Hmm. Well, Carter, it's I, I don't, to, it, it might be. It's taken down periodically, but there's a video of McCartney talking with classical guitarist Carlos Bonell about that, and he and Carlos both demonstrate the Bach and how that led to Blackbird. It's a charming, you know, McCartney is hilarious. Uh, it's a charming um, little video, if you can find it. Yeah, yeah, it's been all demonstrated. And it's really cool. Um, you know, it's funny that you're talking about the kind of war between the Baroque or 18th century language and the blues stuff in both of those songs that you've been talking about so far. And it makes me think of the guitar style, you know, the way that Paul is playing guitar, which is so fascinating. Um, and of course, there was a lot of finger style guitar happening in the UK at that time, like, like an explosion of people playing, you know, probably Dylan really set it off a big time, but there, there had already been this guy, Davy Graham, who did Anne, you know, Angie yeah. and and then Bert Jantz and, and John Renborn were playing together, and people sometimes refer to their style as being folk Baroque or Baroque folk. They, they played duo, uh, and they created a, a kind of similar effect to what Paul McCartney creates on the guitar in this, I think. But he's doing it all by himself, but I think he's taking <coughs> kind of finger style thing and he's adding these parallel tents, like you guys are talking about to the finger style texture. So it's, you know, he's animated that like a Travis picking thing, but it, but it does have that Baroque kind of style too. So I think that's another way of answering your, your question. Maybe you can. Okay. Is Blackbird a very difficult song to play? I noticed that Paul, when he's in concert, he always seems to avoid the instrumental <laughs> section. He plays a shorter I mean, I version think, of Blackbird. It's not really technically difficult to play, but I will say that al almost everybody plays it wrong, i.e. they don't play it like Paul plays it. Mm. So, I mean, it's interesting, actually. You know, when maybe I use the word Travis picking already, and you hear that a lot when people talk about the acoustic guitar style of that era. Mm. And probably people don't have a very clear idea of what it is. But, you know, they were in India in Rishikesh, in Rishikesh with the Maharishi and Donovan was there and he was playing this Travis style finger picking. And that's something that he, you know, probably got from Dylan, but it's on songs like um, Ballad of Geraldine, sort of. And the major defining element of it is that your thumb goes. John Fahey calls it the alternating bass. And people like Merle Travis, who was, you know, a, a guy from the, from the American South who didn't invent the style but gave his name to it, would make that into uh, something that was derived from stride piano like Jelly Roll Morton, and it goes all the way back to ragtime. So, you know, it's 
got a kind of a boom chick thing going. Well, again, with the thumb, though. So the thumb's like the left hand of the piano. In more kind of folky styles, it became that a lot of times. But still, the thing is that the thumb is doing that, and then the upper fingers <laughs> are doing this little dance on the offbeats. The British guitar players, like Renborn, added more classical technique into the mix. Merle Travis did his whole thing, even as fast as he played, with just two fingers. Other people use three fingers, but the, these two plus the thumb. But the, the British guys like um, Renborn are using all these fingers, and it's, it's more classical technique. So that's, that's part of Paul's whole sort of combination of, of um, influences. But th the story that Donovan, you probably heard him tell, is that John Lennon wanted to learn this style. He heard Donovan playing, I want to learn that. And Donovan said, well, you know, this is going to take time. Like, it's not easy. And they're in India, and John said, you know, I've got time. And he said that John was a good student. And John did learn the style. As you'll hear, Jack's going to talk about Julia and Dear Prudence, where he does play Travis Picking. But Donovan said that Paul just kind of was interested too, but he was just kind of hovering around them and sort of looking out of the corner of his eye and he didn't really learn how to do it properly but he came up with his own way of doing it mm -hmm. so oh. what that is in black words to make a long story short is that he doesn't pick these off beats with the thumb he does this kind of strange flick with his index finger and then so he starts with the the note there the the, the pinch we would call it which is the parallel tenth and then he goes He's flicking up and down, down, up, and down. So people who talk about this talk about it as being a unique way of playing the guitar, which it is. Um, but in researching all of this, I've been looking at an instructional video by Mike Seeger about the guitar style of Mother Maybell Carter, who was sort of the matriarch of the first family of of country. You know, she she was one of the first what they used to call hillbilly artists to record all these old American songs, I think in 1927, the same year as Jimmy Rogers first recorded. And she actually basically played that way. And her style was influential, again, much copied, but not necessarily very accurately, a lot like, um, like Paul's way of playing. But it actually has a name. It came to be called the Carter Scratch. And the Carter Scratch, you can hear on songs like Wildwood Flower. <laughs> So it's the same thing, right? It's with finger picks, it's brassier sound, but. So if you take that and you add a pinch of the outer voices. You basically, you have like a variation of the Carter scratch. So I was thinking maybe it could be called the McCartney scratch. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You know, Cameron, when you were uh, demonstrating, I think it was Travis relation to uh, stride piano and you played that fast thing. I, I was hearing George doing Chet Atkins. In the yeah, right. Well, Chet, I mean, Merle Travis is the big influence on, on Chet Atkins for sure. Yeah. And so it goes into rockabilly. It goes into so many places you know that that travis picking thing is like this rich vein that runs through the whole 20th century of guitar and, and beyond but sometimes it's a little bit hidden or it gets transformed in cool ways i had read that uh donovan also had referred to it as claw hammer technique which comes from banjo of uh you know there was with the finger picking be able to do that but when you demonstrated mabel carter that sounded more like blackbird than travis picking to me because you're using your index finger to get that that sort of scratch happening is what mccartney does yeah and and if mccartney couldn't grab it right away you know donovan says maybe because he was a lefty you know and i was playing righty so right mccartney walked away with whatever he could from it and then made it its own so you know what comes to my mind is this that 
oh, well, did it come from a certain place in the world? Did it come from a certain time in the world? Or is it just the evolution of learning how to accompany yourself, you know, that you get to this place with it, right? Yeah. Because if, yeah. if you do look at Julia, you know, you do, you get that Travis picking. And, and as Cameron had demonstrated, it's that root and fifth kind of motion. <laughs> just a rep that's a pattern that's just a repetition over and over again but Lennon did something that was very unique with that but talking about Merle Travis and, and Chet Atkins like that's a classic Chet that it's not a Chet Atkins it's a classic song called windy and warm that was one of the first pieces that kind of made Chet Atkins a little bit famous. It brought him popularity. But that's that old Travis. It's just a repetition what you do on the strings. Now Lennon, he took that and he ran with it. Now Cameron and I had done a podcast with Robert Rodriguez talking about formulas that the Beatles had that they would use time and time again. And I would demonstrate McCartney on how he would use this descending step pattern in his piano playing. You can hear it in Hello Goodbye, you can hear it in Hey Jude, you can hear it in For No One, and a number of other Beatles songs. And you know, this takes us back to classical music in Bach, when you can really analyze this stepwise motion. If you have, for instance, if you're in the key of C, and you descend stepwise down the scale, with each one of those notes descending, you can add a chord in the right hand on the piano. And McCartney demonstrates this sort of idea with Rick Rubin in McCartney uh, 3 2, one And it's easier to see on the piano because as you descend the scale, it doesn't have to be the root of the chord. It could be another uh, note of the chord, but it starts to color everything that you're doing. And it brings up a lot of nice options that happen. Um, we begin to talk about what came up the, the term musical relationships and it's what has led me to continue to have this deep dive into Beatle music as long as I've been listening to it and as long as I've been playing it and now that we have this class you, you know my wife teases me as I'm sure your spouses tease you like why don't you go out and get on a bowling team? Don't you guys have anything better to do than just continue to talk about the Beatles, right? But why do we do this? Because when we started this class, it's like we could have taken another pop group, but of course it's going to be the Beatles because it's the best example of how these musical relationships work and how they resonate within us, whether it's lyrically or obviously it's musically that, that resonates with us and in the same way that box music resonates with us, right? There's a rhyme and a reason to this puzzle. And when we study this music, we have our students and we can say this, these are great examples for songwriting. These are great examples as uh, to raise your skill as a musician. Because when you get inside this stuff, you learn how to apply it to what you do as a musician. And of course, these guys didn't go to school for this, right? They put their 10,000 hours in, in Hamburg and at the Cavern, and they also had ears for it. And they also, you know, if you look at McCartney's younger life, he grew up with a father that played music all the time. And I know myself, you know, being around artists that grew up with parents that were musicians, it's, second, it's a second language for them. So I think McCartney had that advantage. Um, of course, the sum of the parts are better, or, you know, are, are greater equal than just the individualism that happens in that band. Um, but together, they put something um, that will last as long as, as box music. But if I'm going to look at, as we were talking about Julia, and I just want to look at what I said, Cameron and I did this podcast with Robert Rodriguez, and we were looking at formulas that are repeated <coughs> in Beatles music. And... I was kind of taking the McCartney role and, and Cameron was taking the Lennon role. And what we looked at was how many times Lennon repeats this single note melody um, over and over again throughout Beatles songs, right? 
come together. Here come old flat top, he come grooving up slowly. That's kind of one note. When I was younger, so much younger than today, right? Turn off your mind, relax and float downstream. You know, picture yourself in a boat on a river. We see a lot of this. And then Cameron had pointed out in Julia that half of what I say is meaningless, but I say it just to reach you, Jew. That's 17 tones of one <laughs> note for a melody. And only Lennon can do that and take us on this journey. Now, I think the White Album is the most Americana sounding Beatles album to me and there's a there's there's a lot of reasons for that but it's obviously the acoustic guitars they went to India with just the acoustic guitars and they were influenced by so many things that were happening at that time but when they come back and they start their recordings and they have Blackbird they have Julia they have I Will they have Rocky Raccoon you know all these songs that are based on an acoustic instrument um, and even even the heavier tunes whether it's Helter Skelter whether it's your blues to me they still sound like American songs you know um, it's it's mind blowing to remember that Sgt. Pepper was the the record right before the White Album. I mean, you can't really include Magical Mystery Tour because that was um, a film and that was on on the heels right there. So you might as well say Magical Mystery Tour and Sgt. Pepper almost being the same record because of the psychedelia and the songs. But for the Beatles to take such a hard left with the White Album from the presentation of the album to no less so much less studio trickery on that album. Um, it was really an, an intent on what they were doing um, musically in the studio. Um, when we start our class up in, in January, uh, we're going to get into a lot of this discussion. I'm going to ask Cameron to share his screen for a second to give you guys an idea of what our resources look, at, look like. We just finished Sgt. Pepper in the fall. We did a semester on Sgt. Pepper. And what we end up doing is compiling these resources of a playlist that show the influences. And of course, you know, the Beach Boys and Brian Wilson obviously made their way into that playlist for Sgt. Pepper, um, as well as other songs and other artists. But we did with a little help from my friends. And then we, we have charts that we show what it is that the Beatles play. We have videos that show how it's done. Um, and then we have these isolated tracks that the students take and they compile in their own session. So whether it's GarageBand or whether it's Pro Tools or any other sort of wave file uh, format, uh, the, the students then learn the parts that we had uh, shared with them and they make their own recordings with each other uh, for these Beatle recordings. I'll turn this down. Yeah, let's that's, our go. that's our cover of it, but I don't want you guys to get a inadvertent copyright strike, even though it's us. So, <laughs> so you, you, you see the music there, and then there's fretboard animation. So this is the bass part, right? So it's got uh, us playing the music, and then it shows you where to put your fingers, basically, which I love. <laughs> so that's the virtual band, and then Walter does what he has been doing um, for your podcast is demonstrating the deeper dive into the recording process, the songwriting process, and the influences. Now, I know for myself, I'm 59 years old. When I first heard the Beatles, I was probably four years old. And um, throughout my life, that music you know, just has raised my skill level as a musician, as a songwriter, as a producer, and just overall appreciating other music. As a kid, when I first started learning Beatle music, I understood not only rock, not only pop, not only folk, not only soul, but it was the Beatles that first turned me on to Chuck Berry. It was the Beatles that first turned me on to Indian music. It was the Beatles that first turned me on to avant-garde music with Revolution Number no. 9 and so forth, right? So it's only helped my musicianship grow and it's what we try to do when we share uh, the school with the students that, that sign up for this. Um, so 
I just wanted to round out our conversation with just sharing people maybe you know at the bottom of your YouTube you can put our link there um, for the school that starts September uh, starts to January 8th and it runs for eight consecutive Mondays 5:30 to 7 p.m. Eastern time and um, Alan's gonna be a special guest I think we're gonna get into a couple things which will be a lot of fun so um, you all are welcome to join us for that. And uh, that's, that's, that's my spiel. Um, you guys are great. Alan, I, I'm, I'm getting your book. I can't wait to read it because more and more, I just can't, I, you know, Timothy Leary kind of summed it up and said, the Beatles are four agents sent by God to enlighten us all. And uh, there's some truth in that. And especially the more I learn about Paul's, I, I think if Bach came back, if you believe in reincarnation, I think he, you know, he came back as Paul McCartney. <laughs> you know? I mean, his his sense of musicality and what he's done for pop music, no one's touched it. So. Just want to add one footnote. Um, we've mentioned Chet Atkins a few times in here, and um, Chet Atkins made a recording of that Bach Boré as well. And it's it's likely that that's the one the Beatles first heard because because George was a big Chet Atkins fan. He he probably had that album. Oh, oh yeah. interesting. Hmm. Something else for something people to look up after the show. They can, you know, probably find it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. does it have? Uh, I wanna... trambone, trambone is the number, the Chet Atkins number that George talks about. Um, Work. I think. Uh, I think the All by Love and Break was kind of based on trombone, mm -hmm. and I think that was so that sort of about the same mm -hmm. time as as uh, the uh, the Bure, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm sorry, Cameron. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just fiddling on the guitar. Is it? Oh. Uh, what's what does the lick sound like? I'm not hearing it right now in my head. I'm just curious. Trambone. Oh, Trambone's God. like da da pee da bum pee da da pee da. Not my head right now either. That's the wrong tune. Yeah. I was just wondering if it one of it was one of those those kind of licks. It's not though. I don't know. I, yeah, Never mind. I, I, I want I wanted to 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 just uh, kind of echo something that you alluded to with this upcoming course being on the White Album about how the White Album is like a perfect course. It's a course in itself, actually. Even if you come from the school of air guitar, like I come from, mm -hmm. um, a proper hand positioning on air guitar to make it look accurate, you know, yard. How do you use a yardstick? Anyway, um, <laughs> but the white album is is a, a, a is a musical lesson in itself. And to me, the white album has become the um, the double album that you measure other double albums up to. Uh, whereas stylistically all over the map, um, Exile on Main Street is, is, is an example of that. I'm not sure if Exile on Main Street sounds like it sounds, had the White Album not happened before. Uh, more recently, even a band like Wilco, uh, their second record being there was a double album, double CD, and that was sort of an intentional uh, way for them to break free. We're not just an old country band. But we threw all this stuff up against the wall and see what's stuck. And it's this double album being there. Those two come to mind immediately. Even Fluid Max Tusk is another, you know, example for me about how the White Album ended up being this whole, I don't know, summarization of all these different parts that all can work together as one. And the other thing that I, I'm glad you mentioned that people, especially here in the United States, a casual fan probably isn't aware of the fact that Magical Mystery Tour, the album, is a creation of a record company and that the Beatles took a year and a half and they went from Sgt. Pepper to the White Album. And not only musically are they very different, but even down to the every nuance of the packaging, the White Album was the anti Sgt. Pepper. Mm. You know, uh, even down to the title, the Beatles were Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now they're the Beatles. That's it. <laughs> you know, there's so many interesting little angles and things happening in there that, you know, I think that the, it's a fascinating topic for the next your next semester. 
uh, and it being a course in itself, the White Album. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, it's got almost every genre of music on it. Um, I am still yeah, blown away that that was the record that followed Sgt. Pepper and everything that you said. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, that's, that's just the brilliance of that band too. With each record, there was a new direction. Um, there was new studio equipment. Um, there were new buttons to push. There were new boundaries to break. Um, and, and they certainly did. I know, as I said, for myself, that being the most American sounding album, I know when it comes to tones, when I'm in a studio or everything that I've, anytime I've been in the studio, it's like, what tones do you try to get when you're making a record? And it's pretty much the tones from the white album. It's like, that's what a drum set should sound like. That's what a bass, I mean, you know, in my opinion, you know, that's what those instruments are, are so true and pure. It's like, that's what you shoot for. That's what you go for when it comes to grabbing tones from a, from a record. Partly because it's a little bit less reverby, less kind of tampered with, you mean? Yeah. Like a, yeah. Just a straight up yeah. good sound. I mean, if you, you listen to a Wilco record, they get those tones, you know? I mean, that of course, there are a certain band that wants to get those tones. If I'm... I'm, I'm particular in that way. There's plenty of bands that, you know, still uh, try to expand upon that, and 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 they do. But I think is a very basic place to start. It's First record fact. where they had eight tracks too, so they're stretching out to twice as many songs, twice as many mm -hmm. tracks. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Then we see in Get Back the documentary, Peter Jackson's documentary. They already don't sound like the band that just did the White Album. No, we're talking we're back even further to uh, yeah. to uh, the primitive basics, right? It's 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 a couple of months have passed, and it's like you know, just, poof, they've changed again. <clears throat> Partly the, out of a, a desire on some of their parts to get out and and perform live again in ways that you know don't involve studio trickery, right? As, as Jack said. Uh, but for other reasons, too. I mean, Lennon loved his rock and roll. He said Bo Diddley could move him really strongly. And uh, uh, he was getting back into truth in packaging as opposed to all the flowery uh, artifice of Pepper. Mm -hmm. you know, Lennon had artistic reasons beyond wanting to get back on stage to to get back to his roots um and the white album was like on the way to get back wasn't it i think of the white album is sort of like um you know Bach had these works either b minor mass is one art of fugue is one that that people refer to as a summa which is basically a, a work that brings in all the knowledge one has about that particular form. And I think of the White Album as like a, a, a pop music summa, because you, you start with the Beach Boys, you've got blues in your blues, you've got a 50s rock in uh, uh, Happiness is a Warm Gun, you've got folk music, you've got avant-garde music, you've got uh, something like Good Night, which is sort of uh, old time, and then you've got you know Honey Pies, another old time. It's sort of like like it covers every <laughs> possible style that yeah. a, a pop group could do, and and even beyond a pop group. I mean, most pop groups don't do Revolution Nine, although Fish does. A few other people do, but but yeah, uh, Bo does a great rendition of uh, Revolution Nine. <laughs> who does? Mm, Fab yeah. Foe. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Max Band. Yeah. Um, it's great. Five five players. Right? You don't have any extras in Revolution 9. It's just the five of you, isn't it? No, we do. We use um, we use a sixth member for that. But that, you know, the people will ask me, uh, from knowing the whole Beatles catalog and playing the whole Beatles catalog, which, which is the hardest song for the Fab Foe to do? And, you know, repeatedly, I'll, you know, I'll say, it's I Want to Hold Your Hand. It's not Revolution 9. Mm. Revolution 9, Frank, Will, Frank uh, Agnello and Will Lee 
uh, composed, put together the score for how the six of us or the five of us would read it. And it's a time code and it's color coded, you know. So there's all this dialogue that happens. But Frank and Will also looked at, um, part of it was from your book, Walter, of what those tape loops were from, what symphonic recordings they were, or what tape loops came off of uh, Revolution 1 from the White Album um, at the end. And Frank and Will went back as much as they could and grabbed those original symphonic recordings and, and put them in a sampler, you know? Um, and then, of course, at the end, when you have uh, uh, that megaphone sound, you know, that, that's one of the individuals in the, with the six of us of, of doing that. You know, um, so there's there's a lot of dialogue that happens through that recording. And there's also bits that you're playing at the same time, whether it's on the bass, whether it's, you know, at the very beginning of that piano piece, which I mean, this this is going to go on. So we're going to stop. We're going to wait until Alan is a guest. Uh, and I think we can dis we can discuss so many facets of of that piece of music. I mean, that that's a podcast on its own. But yeah, the White Album never ends. I mean, it's just you can, you can tear it apart. You can, and and we do. And um, it's it's what we love to do in with RPM. You know, instead of having a bowling team. You know, this is that was like why the Fab Fo started. Is like well, we just let's play Beatle music. So here we are continuing to talk about Beatle music. And for those that love to talk about it, you know, come join us next month. Uh, let me just jump in here a little, uh, a little plug, a little Fab Faux plug, because I just kind of want to get this off my chest. If you've never seen the Fab Faux play live, okay, and I'm not a fan of tribute bands. I don't like when they wear the wigs and they look like the musicians they came from, okay? I don't like when they uh, attempt to sound alike, and it doesn't just go for the Beatles with every other band. If I see there's one more Fleetwood Mac tribute band and they're all wearing blonde wigs, I'm going to vomit. But then there's the Fab Faux. I mean, it's about the music. It's not about anything else. Uh, and you guys are really remarkable. And uh, it's been a few years since I've seen you live. Uh, COVID didn't help. Um, but I just wanted to, to just take this second to say thank you. I'm a huge fan. And, you know, more power to you and thanks for doing what you do thanks darren yeah it's 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 a lot of love that goes in into that band we're going on 26 years we don't play as much as we used oh, wow. to since the pandemic it started in 98 um and it was at that time you know before all that stuff was available on the internet that you know you would have your headphones and you would just pull it out a little bit of the jack so you could hear more of one side you know <laughs> and then you know, we would look at some of Walter's books, too, you know, and, and get a better idea on how to get inside some of that music. Um, and even now, with all the stuff that is available online, you know, now we go back and we still look to how we can refine and, and play that stuff better. Um, but there's just so much joy in that music, you know, and, and, and whether you're seven years old or whether you're 70 years old, there's a reason why that music is as joyous as it is um and everything that we've discussing about it you know um it just continues so thanks to you guys with what you're doing you know and your fan base um so yeah it just goes on i just want to repeat what darren just said um i'm not a big fan of beatles tribute bands that dress up like the beatles and have the wigs and the boots and all that i'm more for the fab foe and dressing up in blue jeans and t-shirt and just playing your hearts out and I did see one of your shows. It was in New York City, and Conan O'Brien came on at the very end and jammed with you guys, and it was a great <laughs> show. And, uh, uh, you know, I certainly mean to see more of your shows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Jimmy Vivino had said it's our classical music, and it is, you know, and it's like, you know, Cameron and I have a classical duet called High Low Duo, where Cameron had arranged all this great music for guitar from Ravel and Bartok. And it's like, you know, we we can't teach this stuff in a way, but we as musicians just have such a love for it that that um, uh, it's you know for those that whether it's it's Beatle music whether it's Ravel or whatever whatever it is when that love goes into it that joy comes out of it you know mm -hmm. and, and it's the fans that see it and recognize that too yeah well, with with all the great music of all historical cultures 
still, um, and I know, I know Beethoven deeply. I know Brahms really, really well. Uh, the Beatles are once in a millennium phenomenon. I, I mean, there's just no other way to think of it. And it's just wonderful to have um, people to talk with who feel the same way. Uh, people who knew they wanted to be a musician when they saw it, that Ed Sullivan show. I don't know how many people I've shared that um, feeling with. And it's just, uh, it's just, you know, we're so fortunate to have this uh, in our lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I just want to repeat also, for me, the White Album is my favorite Beatles album. It's become that for quite a long time because musically it's the most eclectic album there's ever been. And I admire bands that can pretty much do anything, any genre of music, and do it well. You know, there's too many bands out there that are very formulaic. A lot of their songs are written in the same style and produced in the same style. The Beatles didn't do that. The Beatles from the very beginning were musically all over the place. You know, they were not only doing their own pop songs, they were doing Till There Was You. And in, in Hamburg, Falling in Love Again, <laughs> you know, Marvina Dietrich. You hey, know. Fat, hey, Fats Waller, your feet's too big. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it grew and it blossomed more and more. And uh, the White Album was just stretching their their creativity to the fullest, which yeah. they kept doing. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much, guys, uh, Walter and Jack and Cameron, for coming and sharing this stuff with us. And uh, I think it'll be. This, it looks like this will be a great series, and uh, I hope everyone who's watching this tunes into it. So thanks again for coming. Thanks for having us. Okay, so it was great to have Walter, Jack, and Cameron on the show. And um, if you want to tune in to their white album class it's available online and um you know we'll put the uh information in the uh info box on youtube and podbean and where the description of the show is so there'll be more information about that there so let's just go around and um, give our contact information starting with darren all right um i'm not exactly sure if i'm going to be on the air on the regular schedule with the holidays now just about here. So there may be some days off, hopefully a lot of them, that I'll be taking, but we'll see. Um, but in normal circumstances, uh, I am on the air Monday through Thursday nights, uh, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning, and then Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4 on WFUV, which is in New York City, 90.7 FM, and you can also listen on our website, wfuv.org. And you can listen on our app. You can download the app and have that very convenient way to listen to WFUV. And look for me on Facebook. I have two Facebook pages. And shoot me a friend request to Darren DeVivo or um, my other page, wh whose name I never can remember, uh, and click follow. And... Um, and that's that. That's basically it. Alan or Ken? Ken. Ken or Alan? Ken. Who's next? You. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me directly, you can write to my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. Would love to hear comments from you about this show, my other podcast, my radio show, which is called Every Little Thing. Um, and you can also friend me on my Facebook page at Ken Michaels. A few things I want to bring up uh, on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. I do have Beatles trivia every single week. And because of uh, Denny Lane's passing, it's the Denny Lane trivia question. And you can win, you know, your choice of one of 10 great prizes, including the McCartney legacy, which Alan has right behind him there in red with Paul on the front cover. Or, and get it out here, the brand new book. Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mal Evans. We just had Ken Womack, the author, and Gary Evans, Mal Evans' son, on our show. Check out that one. And, uh, yeah, it's a trivia question concerning Denny Lane. You get it right. You can win one of ten great prizes. And we have CDs, DVDs, and books. So many books you can pick from on that page. Look for the Beatles trivia and games page on Ken Michaels Radio. 
Um, I have a YouTube channel, which is called Ken Michaels Radio, and I just did my first show in quite a while. It was an interview with Chip Manninger, who is the author of Eight Arms to Hold You with Mark Easter. It's uh, the ultimate uh, resource for solo Beatles music up through the year 2000. And he also wrote a book called Strange Days Indeed, which is part of something called Lennonology. It's a chronology of John Lennon's life all up through 1980. And um, we did a show which was all on um, unreleased John Lennon songs that you heard on the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series. And also some songs that have been released that you may not be familiar with, again, from the Lost Lennon Tapes, which was released through the years posthumously on uh, the John Lennon anthology box set or the signature box set or something like the double fantasy reissue where it would have uh, a bonus track like help me to help myself. There may be a whole bunch of songs there that you're not familiar with from John. Many of them were finished. Some of them were near finished. A lot of them were not finished at all, but it's a fascinating study of John's unreleased stuff and a few songs that had been released through the years. But check that out at Ken Michaels Radio. And if you can, please subscribe to the channel. My other um, talk show podcast on the Beatles is called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast with Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo. We're doing a show, uh, actually, the same day as we're doing this. It's on uh, December <clears throat> the 18th, and it's going to be not a heavy talk about Ben on the Run, but for the 50th anniversary of the album, we're just going to talk about the album and what it means to us. And also on this show, uh, when the 50th anniversary edition comes out, we'll do something special for Ben on the Run, which we're going to do on Talk More Talk as well. But we're also going to do something that um, I tend to do on podcast shows and I've been doing on my radio shows for so many years. Once the last show of the year, we talk about the highlights maybe list our top five releases of the year and also our wish list for the following year, which we're going to do amongst the four of us on that show. And once it's up on our YouTube channel, it's there permanently. And it's, and talk more talk is on all the audio platforms as is this show. One more thing to mention my radio program, every little thing. Um, it is featured on Fairleigh Dickinson University's radio station, WFDU. And just recently, they started to uh, do a facelift for their website. And they were archiving my shows there, two weeks worth for a while. And for several months, that wasn't available. But now it is. So if you ever want to listen to the radio program, which is syndicated on about 50 radio stations... Uh, just go to WFDU.FM, to their archival pages, type in every little thing, and they will have the last two weeks that they broadcast of the show. So all throughout the week, any time at all, wasn't meant to put that in there. But if you want to listen to my show, all you got to do is go right to their website. And it's also listed on my website. There's a page for every little thing with all the stations that run them when they run them with links to their stations so you can stream them on those stations but the easiest way to hear the show is by going to wfdu.fm where it's archived there okay i think that's about it okay um you can reach me through facebook either at alan cozen or alan cozen remix there's also a mccartney legacy facebook page you can write to the three of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com um, or you can just comment on the youtube page or on podbean page um, podbean then sends it around to all the other audio services um, all of those we don't necessarily check for comments but um, we definitely check the youtube ones so um, let's see what else you can follow us on twitter or on x uh, at, at things we said fab and we have two facebook pages things we said today and things we said today beatles radio fans so i think that's it for me and um, if you've missed any of this information we've just all given it's all in the description box as well on uh, on youtube and podbean 
So there it is. Um, this is, so far as we know, our last show for 2023. So the three of us wish you all the best for the holidays and for the new year. Um, let's hope 2024 is spectacular. And with lots of releases of previously unreleased stuff and particularly uh, or good new remixes of release stuff. Um, so that, for instance, eliminates the new remix of I Am The Walrus from the Blue Album, which is an yeah. atrocity. But, uh, you know, hey, um, I'm just being, I'm being positive here. So I, so I didn't really say that. Yeah, I did. There might be a fourth yeah. anniversary of McCartney 3. <laughs> it could be. No, there, there should be a, a three and a half anniversary. That's right. Me. Yeah, yeah, with uh, maybe some outtakes instead of his colored vinyl, for God's sake. Anyway, so uh, for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you. See you next time, next year. See you next year. Happy holidays.